And we're live. Uh, welcome, this is Benjamin from Eclipse. Uh, we're back for another virtual IoT meetup. Um, I'm in Toulouse this week, and I'm actually very looking forward to, uh, to EclipseCon uh, next week. The, the Eclipse community will gather in Toulouse for uh, one of our um, annual conferences. And uh, actually, our guest today is also going to join us in Toulouse. Uh, so we thought uh, we would help with the preparation of his talk by doing sort of um, uh, a pre-run of um, the talk that Jan is going to uh, give next week at um, uh, Alex Connor, actually, maybe it's a slightly a different talk. Uh, you tell us, Jan. The um, uh, yeah, the talk is about OSGI and using OSGI for embedded devices. Um, so yeah, without further ado, uh, Jan, why don't you uh, quickly introduce yourself and uh, tell us all about uh, OSGI for embedded? Okay. Well, thank you very much for the nice introduction. Um, my name is Jan Rellermeyer. I'm with uh, IBM Research in Austin, Texas, and I've been working on OSGI for a pretty long time, actually. I think I started in 2005. Um, and I'm the project lead of the Eclipse Concierge project, um, which is part of what I would like to talk about today. So thank you very much for joining um, the live stream today. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good night, wherever you are. Um, and thank you for joining. Um, I would like to talk about Concierge and how to bring OSGI back to embedded devices. Um, just a small command, uh, whenever you have questions about the talk um, or something else, you know, please feel free to interrupt me, ask your questions in the chat on Twitter, uh, whatever your preferred medium is, and, and I will try to answer it. So don't hold back your questions at all. All right, um, this is about embedded devices. Um, embedded devices traditionally uh, looked possibly like this here, like this picture shows. Um, what they have been designed for is typically a fixed function, right? So this is an old MP3 player, uh, which could pretty much only do a single thing, namely um, playing MP3s. These devices have been characterized by very limited user interfaces, um, and the architectures that we used in terms of hardware were often um, ranging from things like 8-bit microprocessors up to ASICs, up to very restricted CPU sets. Um, system on and chips. So much of the talk about embedded devices in the past has been all about what is the right ISA, what is the right operating system, and the software has been uh, playing only a minor role because it was very tight to the hardware. Um, so tight that we often didn't even call it software, but instead firmware. Basically the vendor could control it, but the user had ex uh, no access to it. It was just part of the device that you purchased and never really updated. So what has changed in the meantime is that embedded devices have really been evolving, um, and we see an entire class of new embedded systems emerging. I think IoT is actually a very, very good example for that, and, and we see a lot of the general trends that happen in embedded devices, uh, particularly uh, coming to, fru uh, to fruition in, in uh, IoT. So. What are these devices that we use today? Well, they definitely have more advanced processors. Um, many of them have ARM processors, which are capable um, to the same degree as our desktop or laptop chipsets that we used maybe a couple of years ago. Uh, we have a larger set of capabilities. Most importantly, we have much more sophisticated user interfaces, right? We have, might have touch screens. We might have voice control. Uh, things that typical embedded devices did not have. Um, but to me, the main game changer is that uh, if we think about previously software being firmware, right, these days it's all about opening up the platforms, building software ecosystems, and in the end giving you a device where you can install your own software um, and leverage software that other people in your ecosystem have already written for you. So these devices are a lot more versatile and able to uh, run different things at the same time, um, and that is an important part how devices have changed. So if we just look at one very simple example, right, what you see on the left is a classic thermostat, very, very fixed function device, just a simple control loop uh, with a sensor. Um, and in the view of things like smartphones becoming mainstream, um, this is what a thermostat looks like today, right? It's, it's a much more sophisticated device. Of course, it's also 
uh, visually different in terms of user interface. It has self-learning capabilities. It has an ecosystem. It's connected to the internet. That that's how we see um, embedded devices tr being transformed. So the biggest uh, challenge for building embedded devices, especially in IoT, is actually building these ecosystems and interconnecting all your components. And the cloud is a very, very important piece in this architecture because it's no longer feasible to build isolated systems, right? What we want to do is leverage services in the cloud, making data available in the cloud. Sometimes we even need cloud resources to process data. Uh, but what that means for designing such systems is that ultimately we are looking at a continuous software stack. We have so pieces of software running in the cloud, pieces of software running on the embedded device, and we want them to interact. And that's why, whereas previously uh, much of the firmware has been written in very low-level languages, uh, sometimes even hand-coded in assembly, uh, nowadays when we talk about it, embedded devices, IoT, very often, because of the advanced capabilities of the platforms, we can afford running more high-level software. Um, and it's a recent trend that people actually try to run the same kind of software, both in the cloud and on the embedded device. So we see a lot of Java on embedded devices, but we also see the opposite, right? Uh, software like um, Node.js, uh, which is basically JavaScript, right? Written for end devices. Uh, running in your browser, now moving to the cloud, moving to the server side. So there is definitely convergence between the kind of software that people write for the cloud and for embedded devices. And that's basically just motivating the kind of um, area that we are working in and um, motivating why OSGI is actually an important piece um, in this puzzle. So what is OSGI? Um, I don't expect all of you to be familiar with it. Uh, maybe you have heard about it. OSGI is basically a dynamic module system for Java, right? So why would you, in the first place, try to run Java on an embedded device? Well, it has some definite advantages. Um, one of them being that it's very nice for bridging the heterogeneity that you find, right? Not, not every embedded device is the same, and in fact, they the architectures are a lot more different than what you find on the server side these days where everything is basically x86. Um, so a Java program is claimed to be able to run wherever a Java virtual machine has been ported to. So that gives you a variety of uh, places where you can use the same kind of software. And that, again, relates to this idea of having a continuous software stack. Uh, one of the Disadvantages of Java is, uh, well, I, I will come to that, right? Um, another advantage of Java is that you are able to um, dynamically load software on the fly, right? So that, that was the original killer application that you could actually download software over a network and just run it. Those were the old applets. Um, people were very surprised that that was possible. Um, so in a big picture, um, Java gives you a lot of flexibility um, where you run it, what you deploy, how you update and maintain. Um, and OSGI makes all these tasks a lot easier on Java. Uh, because one of the uh, obvious disadvantages of Java is that built in, it does not have a very good idea of how to manage software modules. Right? So the unit of modularity in standard Java is just a jar file, where a jar file is a compressed file system where you draw your code, your binary. Um, your bytecode from. So um, in a typical setup, you would just put all of these Java files into your class path, and now your Java virtual machine, since it's loading classes lazily whenever it hits something that it hasn't seen before, it will just traverse all these Java files in a linear way and try to find the class that you have been describing in your code. Now, from a software maintenance point of view, um, that's definitely not ideal. Because if you just look at this, uh, at this class path line right, and try to answer any of the questions below, right, it's absolutely not apparent which module contains the main class here, my application main class. Um, you cannot find this out other than actually looking into the compressed file system. Um, you cannot answer the question, what are the dependencies between foo and bar, 
right? There, there's no way to find out if foo and bar are just completely independent pieces of software or if one actually depends on the other, which is important for software evolution, right? What happens if bar is upgraded to bar 101? Will it have an impact on the system or not? Um, those are the kind of things that, that you would like to know because in the end, uh, as I said, you're dealing with a much more dynamic landscape these days and people actually expect that you update software from time to time. Um, if you happen to um, ride a very new style car, right, even, even your car is getting software updates these days. So that's the kind of expectation. And you should better be able to answer these questions to find out the impact. So OSGI is the answer to all these questions, not very surprisingly, because OSGI has introduced a stronger notion of modules where a module is called a bundle, and a bundle is technically a jar file um, that has additional metadata embedded. And this metadata is actually very crucial because in the end, all the information like dependencies uh, are encoded in this metadata. The rest of it actually is very, very similar to a traditional jar file so that bundles are pretty much backwards compatible. Um, you could call them jar files on steroids, right? Um, so dependencies are encoded. Um, other things are encoded in the manifest um, in form of metadata. And that enables the OSGI runtime system, which is called a framework, um, to do effective lifecycle management. And uh, the most... Um, intuitive example is that on an OSGI framework, you can just update a running software artifact uh, without taking down the system. The runtime system is actually able to understand the impact, and if the uh, update does not affect anything that is currently running, it will just allow the update, right? If, if it does affect something that is running, the update is uh, resident, and at a certain point in time, you can trigger it to become effective, and essentially, it will do a micro-reboot of all the components that depend on the piece of software that you're currently trying to update. Um, and that, in fact, is a lot better than what people have been doing in the past. Um, and that is essentially doing a full system restart um, and bringing down the entire system. So um, what is so important about software modules? Well, um, software modules implement two important ideas. Um, the first is isolation, and the second one is locality. Isolation in OSGI is very strong because unless you want something to be shared, bundles are actually fully isolated from each other. So the unit of sharing by default is the package, which plays nicely with the way how you import uh, um, classes in Java into your current namespace and uh, you have to explicitly say that a package should be available to the outside world. If it's not, it will not be visible to the system, which gives you a nice isolation. Um, so in a OSGI system, every module, every bundle is loaded through a separate class order um, and that is important because that actually allows the system to unload a bundle and restore the system to a state uh, that is equivalent as if this bundle has never been loaded. Now, this is a very, very important characteristic if you're thinking about IoT applications or embedded devices in general as being long-running uh, deployments where you do not do a restart every day or so, right? It's important that occasionally you can just purge all software from the system. Now. The consequence of all of that, what I said, is that in unlike in a traditional Java application, if you're writing your application according to OSGI standards, uh, you should consider it as a much more dynamic entity where the actual deployment of bundles changes uh, and is expected to change. So whenever you depend on other pieces of software, it's a very good idea to listen to monitoring events uh, in your OSGI framework and be prepared to react accordingly if uh, somebody decides to change your software. So um, this is just another illustration of how um, basic package import export works in OSGI. We have bundles, which, as I said, are just modules. 
Um, some of them can export packages. They now available to the rest of the system. Other bundles can have private packages. Um, those are not available to the system and can only be used within the bundles. And uh, whenever a bundle depends on another one, it can just declare an import on a package. And then the OSGI framework will make sure that the class loader that loaded bundle A um, will delegate all its class loading calls that affect package one um, to bundle B. So you have a very restricted way of sharing between these two entities. Now, this would not be very powerful if you wouldn't combine it with the idea of versioning, right? Um, updates would fail horribly if you wouldn't have a notion of versioning. And in fact, that's, that's a common criticism in, in Java that neither classes nor packages nor anything else up to this point are versioned. Um, in OSGI, you are encouraged to use versioning in a very, very strong form, and that is semantic versioning. That basically means that you should respect the relationship between major versions and minor versions, where major, major versions can introduce breaking changes, minor versions are not expected to introduce breaking changes, and so on. Um, the OSGI framework will keep track of that uh, in the sense that you can declare ranges of import uh, to your dependencies, and the framework will make sure that you only get things matched to um, an appropriate level, um, version level, of uh, the import that you declare. Um, this is actually a capability that has been widely used in much larger application deployments like application servers, where it's very common that you're actually running uh, different versions of the same software artifact uh, side by side, and different pieces of software running in your application server might have different dependencies to the same uh, package, for instance. So this is basically the low level of how an OSGI framework works. Now, if this was the only way that you could structure your software, you will run into a very complicated problem, and that is everything is still tightly coupled, right? Declaring a package dependency essentially means it's at the linker level. So when you are trying to load this class, either explicitly or implicitly, by referring to it, uh, it better has to be there. Otherwise, you're getting um, a link time error, right? So it's still all or nothing. It's not flexible to the same degree as um, the alternative that I'm presenting here. And that is the idea of having services. So services play at a much more higher level. Um, and a service in OSGI is a relatively simple but powerful concept. It is a piece of implementation that is registered under, typically under an interface to a central service registry. Now, that essentially means that if you're using services, your software becomes loosely coupled because you don't necessarily have a dependency to the implementation, but instead you're limiting your dependency to the interface of the service. And that is usually much, much less in terms of transitive closure. So if you had a logger, for instance, um, all that you would depend on is the interface to loggers in general. You would not necessarily need dependencies to a particular logging implementation, just to pick a random example. Um, this idea is important because, essentially, you can now write your software in a much more flexible way. Um, as long as the interface for logging is available, you can actually write software that can still function absolutely correctly, uh, even in the absence of logging. So you can implement software that has the idea of optional extensions. Um, and if you think about it, that's exactly the way how we are using it in applications like the Eclipse IDE, where you're extending the basic uh, IDE by different uh, optional extensions, um, and that in the end is an idea that relates to OSGI services. Now, the idea of services, I would say, is relatively pervasive these days, right? We use them even across the network. We have used them in terms of uh, web services, um, in terms of uh, SOAP, right? 
Um, so it's it's relatively old. We use them in JEE. Um, the big difference in OSGI is that the overhead of using services is very, very minimal. Because ultimately, once you have asked your service registry for a particular service, you are handed an implementation in the form of a Java object. So there is no proxification going on. After you've done this initial uh, lookup or discovery step, it is just a Java object, and every call will have exactly the same performance as if you had been hardwired to this object instance from the very beginning. Um, and that is actually very explainable, this design, because ultimately OSGI initially was designed for embedded systems, right? So people were very cautious of designing lightweight abstractions. Um, and services work very, very well for these kind of applications. So um, what is the service registry in OSGI? Well, uh, ultimately, it is just a central piece of uh, the OSGI framework that you can consult and ask for services. Um, you can ask the service registry for services that implement a specific interface, and um, you will get one or more, or maybe even zero, uh, if there is no service register. Um, so it is very easy to... Um, depend on multiple service implementations, right? Because um, you, you, you will always write your software in a way that it's dealing with these cases as well. Um, you can also ask your services for matching particular properties, because when a component registers a service, um, it can attach basically a dictionary of properties to it. And then um, clients that are interested in services can use uh, relatively expressive adapt filters to restrict the set of services that they are interested in. So um, that is a very good way of uh, distinguishing between multiple implement implementations. And as I said, um, there is no runtime overhead. Once you have a service, it's just a Java object. So. Um, how does this relate to IoT? Um, well, it's actually a very powerful concept because IoT systems tend to be very dynamic, right? Um, they tend to be dynamic because we are often dealing with components that are interconnected through a network. Uh, we might even deal with components that have less than 100% availability due to various reasons. So um, in another... Um, way of viewing that ultimately we are often in a situation where we have an end-to-end -end relationship between producers and consumers and by that I mean it could be 10 producers two consumers it could also be one-to-one -one. Uh, we don't know exactly um, at runtime that might even change over time so um, traditionally this sort of relationship between producers and consumers is implemented through some variation of a listener pattern. Now, the listener pattern is not a very ideal solution because, in the end, it creates a relatively tight coupling between producers and consumers. And ultimately, you will end up rewriting a lot of code um, for different consumers, um, just basically all the bookkeeping between producers and or consumers that are currently available. Now, in OSGI, there is a very pervasively used and very interesting pattern that basically turns this relationship upside down, and it's called the whiteboard pattern. So the way to understand that is it's using the whiteboard, uh, uh, the, the, sorry, the uh, uh, whiteboard as a neutral entity where um, event listeners register themselves, and that way they are just residently available. Um, and whenever an event source is able to post messages, it will just try to find all the listeners currently registered and post the event to them. That way, you always get an end-to-end -end relationship. So you are very flexible. And without doing many maintenance steps, um, you have a loosely coupled system where basically events get automatically broadcast to every listener 
And once again, as long as this is on the same device, um, there is absolutely no overhead involved. So you get loosely coupled, the loosely coupled system um, at a very low price. Um, now, the code that you would write for the event source, if you would do it all manually, would still involve consulting the service registry once, um, maybe getting an array of all the currently registered listeners, um, and then listening to lifecycle events. That means listening to whenever a listener uh, appears or goes away. Um, and that is very common. That's almost boilerplate code that you need very often in OSGI applications. And that's why um, there is actually an implementation in the OSGI API that relieves you from this, uh, from this work. Uh, and it's called a service, um, a service tracker. So as long as you use a service tracker, you get the entire package in one. You get an initial state of the system when you start the tracker. So everything that is already there will be available to you. And the tracker will automatically react to the lifecycle changes and internally uh, change the current state of available listeners. So as long as you use the tracker, uh, you can actually treat this as uh, almost like an array of all the available listeners um, that will just automatically adjust to, to the current reality. So it's a very, very low overhead solution to building flexible systems. Um, maybe that's a good point to ask if, if there are any questions about OSGI in general and, and how it can be used with IoT. I haven't seen any for now. Uh, a quick reminder that, um, as Jan said, should there be any questions, uh, feel free to tweet them, uh, virtual IoT hashtag, or uh, comment on meetup.com. Uh, we'll definitely take your questions at the end, but it's um, also a good idea to ask them right now, so as we have time, uh, plenty of time to answer them. So yeah, I don't think there are there are more questions uh, uh, regarding OSGI at the moment. It's actually very clear, at least from my point of view. So okay, well, just I, I take this as a compliment. All right, that was okay. a compliment. <laughs> so, uh, so then um, let's move on, and and I can tell you what uh, what concierge is uh, now now that you hopefully understand what OSGI does, right? So concierge was the answer to my personal question of what is the minimum overhead of OSGI. And I started that in, I think, 2000, uh, early 2006, during my time as a PhD student at ETH Zurich. Um, I simply wanted to see myself how small can I implement an OSGI framework uh, so that it still implements the entire core spec, uh, but being very minimal. Now, the answer to that at that time was that I implemented an OSGI R3 core implementation that had the footprint of only 86 kilobytes. Um, and not only that, it was very simple and readable because it only consisted of seven Java classes and seven inner classes. Uh, still, it was uh, a complete implementation. And people found the source code very readable and understandable. So I, I heard from quite a few people who actually used my implementation to educate themselves about OS, how OSGI is uh, structured internally and how it works as a system. Now, in those days, uh, there were a variety of embedded systems that I uh, tried to run my concierge on. So on the left-hand side, you see a sensor network node that was an Intel iMode, um, one of their um, answers to um, the emerging sensor network market uh, in, in those days. Um, I also used a, a Linksys router. Um, there were a couple of routers that had uh, very, very nice known vulnerabilities that would allow you to um, basically uh, boot into your own operating system and, and own the device, uh, circumvent the firmware and turn it into an open, uh, into an open device. And this was actually one of, uh, one of my favorite demos because I just set it up with, with a concierge um, I set it up with my ROSGI, which is an extension of the OSGI idea for distributed systems. Um, and I would have a system that I could just place uh, in the room when I was giving a presentation, um, power it up, it would start a, a, 
private um, virus LAN uh, network. People could connect to it, um, open a browser. It would just catch all requests redirected to a web page, uh, and then you could start um, the demo on your device. And that that was just a, a plug and play solution to to demos. I, I actually liked it very much. Um, another thing is this uh, Linksys NSLU2, um, also called the Slug. Um, that was a device that was sold as a USB to network bridge um, for storage. So you could hook up your USB hard disk drives and make them available to your home network. Uh, but once again, it was a very, very affordable uh, embedded device that had an ARM CPU that was running Linux. I think you got it for like 99 bucks. Um, and I mean, we must not forget those were the days prior to things like Raspberry Pi. So uh, very, very likely that was the cheapest embedded device that you'd buy off the shelf in those days. Um, I also used it on PDAs, which were the mobile devices of those days, right? Um, this is an iPack. Um, from Compaq or later from Hewlett Packard uh, when they took over. So that, that was an interesting piece of work. Um, so what was the biggest challenge in writing an OSGI implementation that was that small? Well, the first thing is um, you have to restrict yourself to the lowest common denominator. And in those days, uh, some of these devices didn't even have a full Java 2 virtual machine. Some of them were running very, very odd outliers like personal Java, which was somewhere between 1.1.8 and 2. Um, and even if they had a full Java virtual machine uh, in the sense of a full Java 2 virtual machine, um, many of them did not have JIT compilation in those days. So getting reliable performance out of your device was actually pretty challenging. And I, I wrote the code with a very, very big focus on performance. So avoiding overly object-oriented patterns, um, avoiding using high-level things like iterators that, um, in the end, if you don't have a JIT compiler, uh, can affect the performance very adversely. Um, and also just you know keeping, keeping the design simple keeping the design fast, keeping the code path uh, small. Um, and, and that turned out to be a very good idea that ultimately I kept doing. Um, so in, at some point, we were contacted by the Eclipse Foundation because they were interested in having an OSGI framework that was particularly tailored to IoT. Um, and they looked at our old implementation and again, found it interesting and readable and small. So um, we had the idea of just bringing this up to standard, uh, which was R5 um, at that point in time, while keeping all the good properties of it, right? Keeping its small footprint, readable, um, backwards compatible to the Java virtual machines that you would typically find on embedded devices. And beyond that, maybe also being a sandbox for innovation around OSGI, because ultimately it's a lot easier to do experimental things on an implementation that has just a few handfuls of classes um, rather than one that has hundreds of classes. Right? Um, so what was the alternative that people were using? Um, well, there are definitely other OSGI frameworks around, um, and within Eclipse there is Equinox. Now, uh, what people see very often is that these OSGI implementations are more tailored for very large deployments where resources are not necessarily an issue and uh, you can use a lot of memory, you can use a lot of tricks to speed up um, your bundle resolving, for instance, right? Uh, by doing aggressive caching. Um, and many of these implementations also implement a lot of things that are not directly related to OSGI, but they are kind of necessary to run things like an application server or um, the Eclipse IDE, and that, uh, of course, hurts the footprint of the implementation a little bit and sometimes also performance. So 
we try to um, take on the challenge and uh, basically port our own implementation to R5, which um, is actually a pretty big challenge if, if you just look at uh, how OSGI had evolved over time. Um, R3 had an API that only consisted of 28 classes, and in fact, most of the classes are interfaces. Uh, with all the different versions that we have gone through uh, since these days, uh, these days, an R5 implementation already has 99 classes in their API, so more than a factor of three. Um, and if you look at the different capabilities that OSGI has introduced since R3, some of them are actually relatively powerful, but also not necessarily straightforward to implement in in a uh, in, 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 in a way that they perform very well, right? So just to pick one example out of the many, um, in R5 we introduced this idea of a generic requirement capabilities model, um, which in other words is just a way of doing dependencies that are not Java classes uh, and not packages, right? So um, you can just declare, for instance, that your device has a certain capability, and then you write a bundle that depends on this device capability. For instance, a specific operating system or a specific hardware sensor being there, and so on. So prior to that, we had one sane way of doing dependencies that was packages. We had one way of doing dependencies that some people in, in the OSGI world consider a little bit ill-defined, and that is depending on entire bundles, but that was about it, right? So you could actually do this matching um, in a very optimized way because you, you, you basically knew what you were optimizing for. Now that requirements and capabilities can be anything, um, this is, of course, a lot harder. And uh, either you implement the system as a complete duplication of your existing package um, and bundle wiring system, uh, which blows up your code. Uh, but if you design a system that is flexible enough to handle all of them, it might hurt the general, uh, the, the more specific case, and that is um, resolving against packages and bundles. So um, that 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 is just one example out, out of a few that I could make um, to illustrate that. Implementing an R5 framework um, with with this design in mind is actually far away from being trivial. So um, where are we now with Concierge? Well, um, we had the goal of being fully R5 compatible, and we achieved this goal with our first release that we did uh, for last EclipseCon Europe. Um, we also said we want to keep a small footprint and work well on embedded devices. Well, in terms of footprint, we are at 250 kilobytes. If you do not uh, need debug symbols and 330 kilobytes if you need debug symbols, um, that's a lot more than the 86 kilobytes. But if you, if you take apart um, our jar file, you see that already quite a bit of the uh, additional footprint comes from the API itself, so the implementation is actually still uh, relatively lean if you compare it. Um, remaining readable, well, currently we have nine full classes, um, a much higher number of inner classes. That's just a problem in, in, in Java in general, um, that very often you have to use inner classes to abstract over behavior, uh, unless you, you're using lambdas, but um, that's, that's typically not yet an option on embedded devices. And remaining backwards compatible, well, we decided to ultimately stick to Java 5 because just in time, um, Oracle released the compact profile of Java 8. And finally, we saw embedded devices moving away from the old 1.4 uh, JVM implementations, which was basically what uh, JME uh, was stuck at. So um, that is where we are now. But, of course, the important question is, uh, what is the performance and what is the behavior on embedded devices? And I will try to uh, elaborate a little bit on that by showing you some experimental results. Now, I'm 
using two specific devices for my performance comparisons, uh, simply because I own them and I've set them up. Um, the one is a BeagleBone Revision A5. Um, it's, it's not really the most recent version anymore, but I think it's still capable of running state-of-the-art software, so, so I keep it and, and, and use it. It's actually very pleasant to use because it has a working serial port over USB, so you can just plug it in um, and directly interact with it, um, that, which, is, which is actually an advantage in, if you are uh, trying to deploy software rapidly. Um, it has an ARM Cortex A8, um, 256 megabytes of RAM, which is really not a lot, if, if I mean, by, by, by the standards of an embedded Linux system. And we're running two different Java Virtual Machines. The one is an SE embedded 1.7 version, and then a Compact 1 profile that we built for Java 1.8. Um, the other platform that we're using is Raspberry Pi B, um, and you're possibly familiar with that if, if you're interested in, in, in IoT. Uh, and we are running a Java SE build that is uh, particularly optimized for, for this platform by Oracle and that you can download. So um, we, here we are comparing against the other OSGI framework implementations that people commonly use. Um, and uh, I should say the other open source um, implementations. We, we are not really interested in comparing against uh, commercial implementations at this point. So uh, one of the alternatives is Equinox. Um, Equinox is what drives the Eclipse uh, IDE, among other things. Um, and uh, this implementation has a footprint of 1.3 megabytes. Um, that is without any optional uh, parts, so uh, no console um, or, or things like that. Uh, we are also comparing against the latest release of Apache Felix, which has 675 kilobytes. We are comparing against Knopflerfish. <coughs> um, Knopflerfish is actually the smallest implementation if you look at the footprint. You can download a compact version of it that has 320 kilobytes, so uh, closer to, to concierge. And then our release version 5, uh, which has 254 kilobytes. Now, um, the first thing and uh, part of what people sometimes consider to be frustrating is the startup time of the OSGI framework. Now, the startup time on these platforms indeed consists of the startup time of the Java Virtual Machine itself. Um, and this is here shown in black. So. That is what it takes for the JVM to start up and basically load a class and print Hello World. Um, that, that is the speed of light. You cannot get any faster on, on the JVM. And if you see uh, the numbers here, uh, it's obvious that Concierge outperforms the other implementations by quite a bit, uh, at least if we are looking at Equinox, um, but even comparing to Felix. Um, and that, in practice, is a huge advantage, uh, especially if you're developing on the embedded device because, you know, just being able to uh, do a fix in your code, deploy a new version, and start it within three seconds rather than, let's say, seven or 20 seconds uh, can be a huge advantage in, in practice because you do it so, so often, right? Now... Another thing that we could point out in terms of performance is the service registry because this is ultimately one of the things that you will do in addition to a normal Java application in OSGI, right, doing service registry lookups and registering services. Now, um, I, in the interest of time, I will not go too deep into this experimental setup, but um, the high-level overview is we are registering services that are generated in, in a random fashion. Um, and trying to really put stress on the service registry. Uh, and if we do that, we can just measure the different phases of lifecycle of a service. So this here is uh, for registering services, and you see that Concierge is consistently the fastest framework uh, um, among the four that we looked at. Uh, you can also see that for this particular benchmark, uh, Java 8 actually helps. Uh, we can see that because we have both a 7 and an 8 version on the BeagleBone. Um, the service lookup, again, uh, is, is the best implementation. Felix here is a bit of an outlier. Um, 
and we don't exactly know why that happens. I uh, I, I know this many of the Felix people, and 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 I, I shared my uh, my test cases with them. So so they are looking into that because they thought they had already optimized a lot in their service registry. But it turns out on these small devices, it, it's it's just not very competitive. So, Jan, we have actually a very good question from uh, Maurice. Uh, yes. Since you're comparing uh, the, the frameworks, um, compared to other OSGI frameworks, what is what concierge cannot do compared to an Fish and others? Very good question. Yes. Um, the, the, the answer is if we are talking about the core standard, there's nothing that concierge cannot do. It's, it's a full implementation of the core standard. If you look at an OSGI implementation to be uh, an ecosystem of a runtime system plus additional services, uh, our ecosystem is definitely smaller than some of the other implementations that have been around for many, many years and that have accumulated uh, services around them. But then OSGI is, is a mix and match model, right? So there's absolutely no reason that you couldn't use a service from Equinox, from Felix, from Knopf the Fish, on the concierge framework, um, you you might not get the same uh, the same performance benefit <laughs> at this point, right? It, it it will behave like like a Felix or, or Equinox implementation, right? So, um, but but to answer the question, there, there's really nothing that 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 we have not implemented. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the question. That that was a good one. <laughs> um, so yes, this is service lookup, uh, and you see at, at some point the, the differences are not, you know, very very large, but in the end it's it's about also about consistency, right? Uh, being consistently the fastest framework on a variety of different devices that run different Java virtual machines, in practice that that can make a huge difference. Um, service unregistration, as as I said, in the interest of time, I don't want to go too deep into that. Um, there's one other aspect that we can measure, and that is resolving bundles, right? That that is an overhead because uh, at runtime, when you're installing a bundle, it has to find all its dependencies um, through through the OSGI framework. Um, <coughs> and in order to measure that, we again in, um, wrote um, a little test that generates random bundles um, after a certain recipe. So it turns out that um, for repeatability, um, because this idea of doing matching um, in in the um, in the OSGI framework um, is relatively complex, um, you cannot deal with a, a very high degree of randomness. Otherwise, um, you would have to do so many repetitions to get stable values. So we just uh, we just um, persisted one uh, topology one randomly generated topology and use it across all the devices and all the frameworks to have comparable numbers. And you see again, uh, for instance, the performance of installing a new bundle. Um, concierge is consistently the fastest. Uh, resolving, again, is uh, very important to, uh, in the sense that it contributes to the startup time after the JVM has been started. Uh, now here you see one uh, line being missing and uh, Knopflerfish at the point was not able to resolve our deployment. Um, at last EclipseCon Europe I was able to talk to the Knopflerfish people, share my test with them and, and they actually found and fixed the bug. Um, but I think they have not released a new version so it's fixed in Git. Um, I, uh, for Hopefully for the talk next week I will be able to pull their latest head of Git uh, build it and, and just uh, try to get numbers for them as well. But yes, you see um, the performance is again um, among the best. Uh, now the Equinox number is to be taken with a grain of salt because actually Equinox caches very, very aggressively. So this performance shown here is for the first time that you resolve a new deployment. If you do not purge the intermediate state that Equinox uh, accumulates across different starts of the framework. Uh, subsequent resolving attempts would actually be very, very fast because it's reusing uh, knowledge that it has prior uh, that that is that it has acquired from from prior resolutions. So that that is a clean 
uh, resolving attempt. Okay, so um, I showed you a little bit of performance, but in the end, performance is not the only metric of how people uh, look at an OSGI framework, right? Another one is obviously usability. Now, you can question what does usability mean for something as low level as an OSGI framework. Well, our answer to this is don't be annoying, right? Just try to not be in the way of people uh, writing applications and running applications on devices. Uh, and to us, the first and most important part of that is stay close to the core standard. Because it can be very confusing for people if you're mixing your own uh, features with standard features because then people who are buying into your implementation will have a hard time differentiating what is standard and if they ever want to move to a different platform, uh, they will have a bad surprise at this point. Right? So we stay very close to the OSGI standard. Uh, we implement it completely. We pass all the test cases, the official test cases, so we can, uh, in this sense, claim that uh, we are a complete implementation. Uh, but then every OSGI framework has some extra functionality that is not strictly prescribed by the core standard. Um, for instance, for the longest time, Equinox had a console built into the OSGI system, into the OSGI framework. Well, um, we have decided to take something that is optional and provide it with the core framework uh, because of a very particular reason. Uh, what we decided to ship is a lock service, and we believe that this is a very powerful concept because part of the bad experience that some people initially have with OSGI is that the gap between static compilation of software and the runtime behavior once you deploy it to a real device has widened a little bit, right? Because now you have these dependencies and your build system might actually use different metadata for resolving dependencies than your runtime system. And that means sometimes in your workspace or in your build system, uh, it looks like everything is perfectly fine. Everything just builds. Now you deploy it, uh, and it seems to run fine, but at some point, because uh, Java actually does uh, lazy loading of classes and services are inherently lazily acquired from the registry, uh, your system might just blow up at a certain point because you had an error that you could not detect statically. Um, and um, this can be a bit of a problem if it manifests itself as an application-level error, uh, which you cannot easily correlate to an OSGI event underneath. So by shipping a lock service with the framework, you actually have the choice to use the same lock service in your application, and now you can you have synchronized output from your application and your OSGI framework, which in our experience makes debugging a lot easier uh, than having separate unsynchronized lock syncs. So. Um, that is part of what we do uh, in addition to the standard. Uh, we also have chosen to uh, pick a relatively lean and, uh, well, I would say easy to handle way of writing deployments, um, forming applications with concierge. Basically, all that you need to do is writing an XArc file. Uh, with the, which is an idea that we borrowed from Knopflerfish. It's just a text file. You write all the bundles that you want to have loaded, and then when you start up the framework, it will look for such an XARX file, um, and it will start your application according to your recipe. Now, uh, we added a few features to this XARX file format that Knopflerfish did not have, um, and one of them is the ability to use uh, enhanced properties. So you can factor out common things from your, uh, from your startup script uh, into variables. And that way, uh, like in this example, it's a lot easier to switch from um, a local repository, for instance, to a, uh, to, a, to a repository on the internet where you draw your bundles from, or to switch between a debugging version and a release version, for instance, right? You don't have to rewrite uh, all the individual bundles. Uh, you can also factor out versions. We support wildcards. So all in all, our 
uh, format is relatively flexible. Um, and this is all based on experience that we got from basically eating our own dog food, right? We have people who are contributors to this project and they are working on uh, building smart home uh, software. Well, they, they run into these issues all the time and, and we learn from them and uh, from the way how they thought they could be more productive in the long end. So um, that is a very easy and powerful way to just write an application in the form of an XAX file, copy it over to a device, um, maybe even draw your bundles from a central build server uh, and you're good to go. <clears throat> Another area that we are looking in is actually enhancing the way how you can interact with an OSGI framework from remote, which is important in, in IoT applications. And I was personally involved in writing um, the REST interface standard for the OSGI Alliance. And we have moved the reference implementation that I wrote um, to show that the standard is actually implementable. Uh, we moved it to concierge. Uh, it was not ready for the 5.0 release uh, from, from an uh, intellectual property standpoint. But uh, now that everything is cleared, it will appear in, in, in a future uh, service release 5.1, which we hope to release shortly after Eclipse Confronts. Uh, so you can basically use a web browser or write a little JavaScript application uh, to interact with your OSGI framework from remote um, and just use REST commands to do that. It's a very easy way of interacting with your framework. Uh, and if you want anything other than that, uh, anything uh, more than that, um, you can always write a web, web interface um, based on these REST commands by just embedding the calls into your, into your JavaScript code very easily. So um, what is next in terms of concierge? Uh, we have several work streams that we are exploring. Um, one is to target the next level of compatibility, which is R6. Uh, it has already been released. And we are actively working on uh, reaching this goal. Uh, hopefully towards uh, this fall, um, and it would be ideal to have it in place for EclipseCon Europe. That's our goal, at least. Um, and indeed, we want to keep it at least as fast and at least as lean. Ideally, we find things that we can even kick out from the code. That, that's always our preference, right? Um, then we want to build uh, um, um, a more wider ecosystem around the core framework by adding auxiliary bundles, like, for instance, Event Admin. Uh, event Admin is already there. Uh, I, j I wrote it um, a few months ago um, from, from an old implementation that I had. We are also thinking about adding things like remote services, because both I and, and another committer have actually a history in thinking about and implementing solutions for OSGI remote services. So we thought it might be a good idea to just combine our efforts and write a modern implementation that is lean and that works well in IoT applications, where you can basically take uh, a remote service um, and embed it into your OSGI application as if it was a local service, and that way you get a very pleasant application model where you get all the benefits of OSGI while having a distributed system. Um, as I said, the remote management based on, re on the REST interface is going to appear. And one actually very important aspect of our work is helping other projects to transition to concierge. We have a couple of projects that have shown interest uh, in moving over to concierge, and we are trying to get everything to them that they need in order to make the step. Uh, because ultimately that's part of our success metric, right? Getting adopted and seeing this being used in larger applications uh, out in the field. So um, this, was, this was basically what I wanted to talk about today. Um, if you want to check it out, um, just clone it from our Git repository or download a release from the homepage. It's very simple. It's very usable, user-friendly, um, and pleasant. So you should try it too. And well, having said that, um, thank you very much for joining today. And I'm happy to take any questions that you have. Thanks, Jan. Uh, there's actually another question from Maurice uh, regarding the um, 
um, access to the OSGI console is there an equivalent to uh, Felix's GoGo or something like that for doing uh, uh, console manipulation of the OSGI runtime? Yes, yes, we, we have a shell bundle. Now, to be fair, it's, it's not nearly as expressive as the GoGo shell, but the positive side, it's also a lot smaller and a lot faster. So uh, you, you can check it out. It has, it has the basic uh, functionality that you would expect, but, but not necessarily things like command completion or uh, a way to, to pipe different commands together. So it's, it's, it's more a lean and, and, and simple approach. I see. Um, so are there other questions? I don't think there are any other questions on Twitter. Maybe I will uh, quickly check on meetup.com. Uh, but well, actually, it was a very complete presentation. So I hope people will um, just listen to your uh, advice of basically just trying concierge and go to the website to, to download it and try it. Yeah, I don't think there's more uh, question at this time. Um, so I will be looking forward to seeing you next week in Toulouse. Um, the webinar was recorded, so uh, for those who, uh, who caught the, the, the webinar um, after it started, uh, feel free to, to just uh, either rewind or just um, or look at the recording on YouTube. Uh, if you have further questions after the recording, feel free to comment on the YouTube video and we'll make sure to forward your, your questions to Jan so um, you, you get an answer. And with uh, with this, I'll thank you all for your attention. Uh, thanks very much, Jan, for the very complete presentation. We'll be back in a couple of weeks. I'm actually not quite sure when's the next um, um, meetup. I will quickly check that out unless uh, Roxanne has the answer for me. Let's see. The next meetup is on June the 16th, so exactly in two weeks' time with Matthias from um, uh, California, from Eclipse California and, and, and Co-op. He's going to talk about um, the W3C initiative uh, for the Web of Things. So that's uh, in two weeks' time. And uh, for those of you in Toulouse next week, see you in Toulouse. Bye. Thanks. Thank you very much. Bye.